Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a Thanks. podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Happy Easter, everyone. Honestly, I think we should all just say that a lot. Happy Easter, maybe even when we're home alone or just touching upon our hearts because it fills the heart with joy to say happy Easter because God redeems everything. And even God redeems circumstances and situations that we may even think even for a heartbeat that it's impossible because it's so difficult or there's so much suffering. But what we learn and what we learn from the life of Christ and the touch of God is that God's joy, God's mercy, God's love, eternal life is forever and is greater than anything else. And I am here with such a joyful Easter soul, Elizabeth Blanke. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. And for this mini retreat today, this mini retreat in a podcast, Elizabeth is going to be sharing her heart and her story. And I'm just so excited to hear from you, Elizabeth, because you have such a special charism and I felt drawn to you. And so I just cannot wait to hear from your heart. And I, I just pray for all of us that we do some of what I imagine Elizabeth is going to be talking about. And is that we re give our hearts over to the Lord in this very moment. Mm. You know, there's scripture about God's mercy being new every morning. And I think we are all dependent on that. We're all fully dependent on the graces and the goodness of the Lord. And so in this moment, may we give our hearts to the Lord and trust that his mercy endures forever. And in that spirit and the Holy Spirit, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Dearest Lord, we thank you. We praise you for Easter. We thank you and praise you that you are joy itself, that you are new life. And for many of us here gathered today, we may need just that, Lord, and you know our hearts and you search us and you know us and you know exactly what we need. So I pray that for each and every person listening that by the end of this podcast that we just, we sense deeply in our souls that we are renewed and we are refreshed and that we are fortified in you to go forward and share that Easter joy with everyone we meet. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So Elizabeth, I would love for you to start at the beginning of your story. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's so funny. Like the, the beginning was the beginning. I was born and no. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think the beginning of my story is really um, starts in high school. It's that's really far back. I know. But so in, in high school, um, I was staunchly evangelical. I had been raised in like a Bible Baptist church. Um, and my mom's dad was a Baptist pastor. So I was raised all steeped in scripture, memorized a ton of scripture, was very passionate about my faith and always from a very young age had a very intimate relationship with Jesus. Um, in high school, I met um, the, the boy who was to become my husband and he was Catholic and he was like the first person I really had a relationship with who was Catholic. And I had been raised not in like an overtly anti-Catholic environment, but also not like, like, you know, there was just like this suspicion and like mistrust of the church. Um, and so when he, you know, was like, when we got, like, we started dating, we got a little more serious we really started talking about that because I was unwilling to be like unequally yoked. I was like, no way. Um, you have to be like a Christian if you're going to, if we're going to continue this relationship. And honestly, I thought like, oh, this will be a cinch. He like doesn't know anything. He doesn't know the Bible. I can just like tell him a million verses and he'll meet Jesus and he'll come to church with us. And that will be that. Um, so as we, we finished high school and went into college, we kept talking about like issues of faith and specifically like the things that, the Catholic church differs on from what, how I was raised, especially like the Pope and the Eucharist and even salvation, the saints and Mary, all of that. <clears throat> we went through like topic by topic and I was like, Ugh, what about this thing? And he'd be like, well, I don't actually know the answer to that. Cause he was raised. I mean, he was raised in like a faithfully Catholic home, but had never really dug deeply into apologetics or any of that. So he was at Notre Dame and I was at the University of Michigan and he met some really great holy priests, took some theology classes. And we together read through like most of Scott Hahn's earlier <laughs> work. Um, and one thing at a time, we, we I was like, oh, that's really logical. And actually they have Bible verses to back up their stuff too, which I was shocked by um, and sort of unwillingly made my way into the church. So in 2005, I was 
received into the church at the Easter vigil. And, um, that was that we, a couple years later, we got married, we had three babies. Um, so at this point now they are, um, my, my children are 11, eight and four. Um, we were so happy. I mean, even through COVID, like we kind of looked at each other at the end of 2020 and we're like, what do we write on our Christmas card? Cause like his job had not been affected. We were homeschooling. So that didn't affect us. 2020 was kind of like almost an easy year because everything extraneous got taken away and we got to just be at home together. And like our life didn't really change in any, any, any we were healthy and everything was sort of fine. Um, and then in 2021, my husband had chest pain and went to the emergency room. They sent him home because they, they told him it was muscle pain. And then two days later he died. He walked out of our house after dinner and he was like, I'm still feeling kind of uncomfortable. And he collapsed on the sidewalk outside of our house and died pretty much instantaneously. Um, he had had an undiagnosed heart issue, like a genetic heart issue. And, um, I mean, in that moment, like my life ended everything. I'm, I just, it was absolutely horrifying. I mean, no warning, no preparation, no conversations about like what we would do or what, you know, it's not like when somebody dies of like a longer illness where you get a chance to say goodbye to them and they get to help you plan for what will happen next. I mean, it was just like you wake up and it's like the apocalypse. <laughs> um, and that was really like, uh, just about three years ago, just over three years ago when we're, when this will air, but, um, it was in the middle of Lent and it was just like walking through the passion. I mean, I, that during that Lent, I just remember feeling like, wow, I can see this now. And this all feels like so close, you know, like doing the stations of the cross or praying through Holy Thursday and good Friday. I was like, this is where I am. Um, and that Easter, I remember feeling like I can't stand it. I cannot stand bright lights and bells and alleluias. Like I can't be here. I'm, my soul is like still in the tomb. I cannot do that. Um, but I kept showing up, you know, I kept being there for my children and, and I felt really, really right away. Like God was calling me to be a witness for Christian hope. Like, how do we respond when a cross, an unimaginable cross is handed to us? You, like, I was like, okay, I get to show people this is what we do. This is how Christians respond when tragedy hits them. Like, you don't lie down and give up. You show up every day and you try to heal and you try to accept it and you just embrace it. Um, and that was horrifying. It was so hard. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It still hurts and is very, very heavy, but... Um, in the last few years, I mean, there's been so much healing and God has really used the tragedy that he allowed into my life to heal many wounds that were happening from before, um, to, it, I mean, no relationship in my life has been unaffected by what happened to me. Every single relationship is different. I feel like I've grown in faith and humility in like surrender. I mean, how can you not? <laughs> um, so yeah. And it's just, it's just taught me to kind of accept each day as it comes. Like I'm not going to know what's going to be around the corner and you just have to let that be what it is. So that sort of brings us to now. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Elizabeth. And I actually have a number of things that have struck my heart because I didn't know that piece about how you were raised in a more evangelical Christian home. And then let's maybe start there. You said first you were unwillingly converted into Catholicism. Is yeah. Did I get that word yeah. correct? Oh yeah. I feel like I was dragged kicking and screaming. Like I wasn't going to disobey, but I was like, really can't we? Like, is there, is there no other way that we can do this? Just because I don't, I wasn't unhappy in my faith tradition. I wasn't like dissatisfied. I just asked these questions that I thought had no answers. And it turned out the church had answers to all of them. And I didn't, I was like, so surprised that there was truth there. And yeah, that's why, that's sort of why I say that. Like, I was just like, you know, it's not like I was coerced into it. I just didn't want to do it. And I had to do it because of obedience to the Lord more than like a desire to be Catholic. Like I was uncomfortable with the idea of being Catholic. 
I so appreciate that authenticity because mm. I would I became Catholic when I was in college and I feel like it's been a deepening journey throughout my lifetime in a sense. Mm -hmm. And you talk about obedience really. And that's what I wanted to understand more fully to our father in heaven. It wasn't about obedience to your husband to be, but no, I mean, yet engaged at the time I was like 18 and 19 going into the church. We weren't engaged. We had talked about getting married, obviously, but a lot of people will sort of convert. I, I don't even really call that a conversion. I know, I know that it is, and it can turn it into that. Right. But a, a conversion is something that is like internal. And so, yeah, I just, I guess I see how you could be confused by the way I phrase that. <laughs> well, yeah. I just, I just wanted to understand that because that's such a significant part of your story. And for those of you who don't know Scott Hahn, he had his own conversion into the Catholic church. So as soon as you said Scott Hahn books, I knew where it was headed, but you, right. you were likely converting to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, reading his story and also his wife, like his wife, I would say she was unwillingly converted to like it. Eventually it became willing. Like, obviously you can't convert without a willingness. But the whole path there is like, not like you're fighting, you know, I don't want to be there. I don't want to do this. Yes. And I love how you brought up the word conversion, because in our faith, we believe that is a return to the Lord with our entire heart. We see our heart is the center of our interior life. Mm -hmm. And I would say probably we would say the center of our life period, the most critical piece of us. And that's where our free will is and our choice to, to give our hearts over to the Lord mm -hmm. in those significant times and seasons of our lives mm -hmm. yet daily, like we already really prayed about. So Elizabeth, here you were really there's no such thing as a fairy tale yet. It sounds like your life was very, very good. And yeah. that it was very joyful and Easter like in many ways. And you and your husband have had how many children together? Three, three children. Mm -hmm. So here you were three children. And even like you said, during the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of change in your life. There wasn't a lot of trauma in the sense that maybe others experienced in our world or in our nation at that time, but just because of your own lifestyle and, and how things were unfolding intimately and personally in your own life, that it was a time of coziness and mm -hmm. coming inward of your family in a real time of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of that, and I think of that intimacy and that closeness that the five of you shared. And then that sudden loss of your husband and the fact that you had been married at 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you were very young when you got married. I like to say I was a child and we've grown up together. Oh, you yeah. were growing up together. Right. And I didn't even know who I was outside of my relationship with him because we grew up together. We were 22 when we got married, like 18 when I was confirmed. So not like a baby, baby, but still when, now when I think about it, I'm like, oh, that is... <laughs> It's really young. Yeah, for our time. Yes. And for yeah. our culture. For yes. Sure. Uh -huh. And so I think about that, that intimacy that mm -hmm. you shared and that you already did have a strong relationship mm -hmm. with the Lord yet in a heartbeat, that devastation mm -hmm. and that unexpected grief and loss. Can you dig a little bit more into that? Um, I mean, honestly, I'm, I felt from the time that I could think consciously about this, that the faith that I possess in my heart and like the staunchness of it, um, and unshakability of it was not something I did on my own, but was really like a pure gift. Like I've always, I've never had a lot of times people in their teens or twenties have like this moment where they're like, I don't know if God exists or if I should, you know, I never had, I never experienced that. Um, and I do think that's part of, you know, it's part of the fault of my, or the, to the credit of my parents that they raised me in a certain way. But I really do think that that can just be a gift, like a beautiful gift that God can give you that he just is, you feel, I just have felt him always present with me. Like I've never had a moment where I doubted that I was loved and I belonged with Jesus. So, um, that did not change. The circumstances of my life changed drastically. I saw just devastation all around me. And I, I knew that Jesus was there. I, um, and I knew he would carry me. I didn't know how I had no idea what like each day was going to look like. How was I going to 
parent my children through this? Like, how was I going to learn how to do my taxes or like all the things that, you know, if you grow up with your spouse, like they have their things and you have your things and like you adult together. I was like, Oh no, I have to <clears throat> figure out how to manage. Like I-, I paying the bills and figuring out, I mean, it, it was just even practical things were so hard, but then homeschooling and friendships and other obligations I had outside the home. I mean, I was very involved in our community and in our church doing lots of, um, organizing things for our like a homeschool nature group. And I was teaching catechesis of the good shepherd, which is like a beautiful Montessori based um, religious education program. And I was, I was super busy and involved. And so I think it was, it took, it, it has taken so long for Jesus to like strip me down. It was like, I was in this super fast momentum of what was happening in my life. And like, I was driving it forward and I was doing all these things that were good, but were keeping me extremely busy. Um, and it was just like one by one, all those things kind of had to fall away until it was. And even like, I'm still learning this. I may never be able to stop learning it. I don't know when I get to heaven, hopefully I'll be like arrived, but just to like be still and be quiet and be with the Lord and, and, not have to be in constant motion. That was, and it took a long time. I mean, in those several months after Jamie died, it, I was, I just didn't stop anything. I didn't let go of anything. I was like, we are continuing. I am still alive. My children are still alive. We have the same needs. We're just going to march forward. Um, cause I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how else you could have done that. I mean, and that might be just my personality, but we're still alive how do you, I mean, how do you decide which things don't belong in your life? And it did become clear, like little by little, which things couldn't, I couldn't sustain, you know, for a while I had to put my kids in school because I was falling apart emotionally and couldn't manage um, them at home all the time. And eventually we did. So we were living in Chicago at the time we lived in Chicago for 17 years. And um, last summer I moved to Michigan to just be closer to family. And that was another huge like severing of who I thought I was and what I wanted. And I mean, yeah, I think when, especially when a spouse dies, your whole future just disintegrates. Like everything you thought that was going to happen, you lose and you lose like your sense of self. You lose who you were in that relationship um, and your future. And you just have to sort of redream everything and deal with grapple with that loss and try to figure out what, what is ahead. I mean, God is so unbelievably faithful. I mean, I don't, I think if he had told me in the very beginning, these are all the things you're going to have to do in the next three years, I would have collapsed. Right. Like, but he showed me one day at a time, like first you will figure out how to do these like logistical things about a funeral that's today. And then you will figure out, about a burial and then you will figure out how to do the taxes. And then later you'll figure out like, you know, as you're, as this, as it keeps going, like one step was revealed to me at a time and he just provided what I needed for that day. And it was, I mean, and he has continued. I mean, he's shown me like one little step and I never know the next two steps. It's like you're carrying a lantern. You know, that John Henry Newman, him lead kindly light. Are you want to sing it for us? I would. It's lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. I mean, and it just is about, I'm not going to see more than a step ahead of me, but that's enough because I know that God is, the Lord is my shepherd and he is caring for me and he will show me what I need to know when I need to know it. And I can just walk forward in faith with one step lit and know that the next step will be revealed when I need to see it. And that's really freeing, you know, because we aren't in control of it. We feel like we are, we like to feel like we're in control of it. Um, But I think we really aren't. And so that's very, it's very comforting, honestly, to just say, I surrender to you. I am not in control and thank the Lord that I'm not in control because I couldn't have possibly orchestrated the provision that he has provided this, this, in this season of our life. 
you could not have orchestrated the provision that he has provided. That is so beautiful. And it just reminds me of supernatural provision, Mm -hmm. the ways like you're talking about that God fills us and nourishes us with living water, with a gift of new life really every day. Mm -hmm. And you talked about God with you and how you've always had faith in that. Mm -hmm. And you've always known that it sounds like deep in your soul. And so you've known that throughout this experience and chosen to trust that God would provide you with exactly what you needed. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth, so many things you're saying strike my heart. One of them that I'd love to dig into a little bit more is that you met your husband so young and you got married relatively young. And that was so much a part of your identity being Jamie's wife. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? And that change in your life. And you use the word redreaming, that you redreamt with the Lord. How has the Lord helped you to rediscover more fully or discover more fully who you are as God's daughter? Hmm. Well, I think in, in our relationship, I mean growing up together and being together for such a long time, there is some, there are some, there are some places where you don't have to grow anymore because, or you feel like you don't like you're like, this is good enough. I've, you know, we've reached like a symbiotic relationship. We can handle things. Um, We're relating well together. We're figuring out the parenting thing, like all of that's going okay. Um, But I think there's also insecurity a little, and I didn't know that at the time, but there's a little bit of insecurity Um, because I never got to be an independent and I don't even think this is like necessary. I think if you haven't gotten to be independent and you got married at 20, you know, the Lord will provide the way for you to grow in a different way, but there is something to be said for having to be an independent agent in the world and not have anybody else to like, if somebody asks you, if you want to do something, you just have to say, no, I don't want to, instead of like, well, we talked about it and we decided, you know, or like, I don't, I'm not sure what he'll say. Cause it's nice. It's a very, it's comfortable to be able to just like pass the buck a little, but it's, it's yeah. So I feel like growing just in my own um, confidence and just being able to say, this is who I am. Um, and not in a proud way, but just in like, I'm a daughter of God. I was created this way. And like, these are the flaws I have. These are my strengths and weaknesses. And if you don't like it, you just probably like move along. You know, I'm not going to be for everybody. Um, but yeah, it's, I feel like it's given me some more confidence and it's also taught me to let go of the things I can't control. So that was a huge breakthrough for me learning about spheres of control and that basically the only thing that I had any control over is my action. So not my feelings, not anybody else's reaction to me, not anybody else's. And again, that's not permission to be a jerk. <laughs> I'm not going to just do things and not think about how other people might feel, but in a, in a, you know, reasonable within reasonable boundaries, I am free to do what is best for me and for my children despite how other people might feel about it. And despite, you know, it bothering other people. So I, that, that was freeing to me. Not that there's been like so much of that, but it is, I mean, everybody has expectations of how things are going to go. I don't think they're even conscious necessarily, but there've been several times like along this road where I've said, this is what we're going to do. And people have been like, what, why? Like we, the, the year after Jamie died, we went on like a six week road trip and just like saw all of our friends all around the country and did like this big fun. <clears throat> and people thought, some people thought it was crazy to do that, but we just needed like something. And I kept thinking, you know, we're not tied down by a vacation schedule anymore, which it's a weird, it's, I don't know. I'm a big, I'm big silver lining type of person. I'm a sanguine to, to, to do you know about the temperaments? I don't know. So I don't, I'm always looking for like, what is positive about this, which is weird to talk out loud about when it's like your husband died. What's positive about that? Like, it's not positive, but we can go on vacation for eight weeks. If we want, we could move to like a different country or we could, because think, I mean, and this is obviously 
I'm speaking from some pretty intense privilege because my husband did provide extremely well and I don't have to, that's not been a part of our journey, like that kind of financial struggle. So I'm super grateful for that. But yeah, just figuring that out and realizing that I only answer to God, (laughs) you know, I think that's the end um, of that. What I'm trying to say there is just that I'm, I'm really an adult. I had to like own that I am truly an adult and I don't have to apologize to anybody. I'm not, uh, you know, accountable to my parents or to his parents or to anybody else. I'm just myself and having grown up with all those parents and never having like totally, you know, it's like, there's like a, this consistency that was there of like being the oldest child, wanting to please and wanting to be like the predictable, like, um, Oh gosh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Reliable one, you know? And then being like, it's not going to be me for a while. (laughs) I'm too, what's happened to me has created a situation where I can't care what other people think right now. I have to just do like just this. Um, So that was uncomfortable, but I think it was really good. It was a huge growth for me. Yes. And like you said, it was very freeing and I'm taking in everything you're saying. I think it's all very, very beautiful. And Elizabeth, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I'm hearing is that when it was you and Jamie, it had been you and Jamie for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then when you had your children, it was you and Jamie and your children together. Mm -hmm. And then very unexpected, unexpectedly, you became the leader of the flock alone on your own as the parent. Right, And so in that, what I'm sensing from you, Elizabeth, but correct me if I'm wrong, is a protectiveness and a clarity by God Mm -hmm. about who you were called to please. And also because of your primary responsibility then, because usually it's God, then spouse, and then children, but here it became God and then children because you lost your spouse. Right, And so what I'm sensing in you is a clarity. And because you'd always sensed God with you, Mm -hmm. that you sensed that God was still with you. And that was who you were called to please. And I think this is mama's in spirit and we have male and female listeners yet at the same time, we have mostly female listeners. And I want to speak to that for a second because I think a lot of us are people pleasers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really hard for a lot of us to, to have that kind of clarity Mm -hmm. of eyes on God, gaze on God, and to have the right order with all the things because there's uh, dynamics are messy. And Mm -hmm. I want to speak to something else, Elizabeth, that you talked about. So a number of years ago, I was in a mini series about whole person care for EWTN. And to be very honest, I felt very ill-equipped when I was going into it. And it was more from a pastoral perspective. So I spent like 16 hours on the phone talking to people who are like all across the board from doctors to palliative care, to hospice, to nurses nurses, to loved ones who'd lost people, to lawyers, like all the things you're kind of talking on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things of all the things that I heard of that I don't know why I just hadn't thought about before is that when we lose someone or someone's dying, that there's still all the other dynamics going on. It's not like that's isolated. Like that's the only thing unfolding. You still have all your children responding in all their different ways to the circumstances, as well as parents, both sets of parents, Mm -hmm. and then all the extended families, your community, your neighbors, your friends, like there are so many dynamics and there's so much input, I think in that way, Mm -hmm. like, and it's really interesting from the pandemic and then going back into kind of the real world, there's a lot of input in everyday life. Mm -hmm. But yet what I'm hearing from you, it was almost like not tunnel vision, but tunnel listen. Like it was a tunneling straight to the Lord to hear the voice of the Lord guiding you Mm -hmm. and being stripped away of that desire to please other people. And maybe the fear of not pleasing other people, because that can be really intimidating and scary, especially at first. And especially depending, like you talked about being the oldest, like we're all We're all raised with all different kinds of ways that we think and demands on us, whether they're real or we make them up in our own heads that become our reality and our patterns. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing is with this very, very unexpected, critical loss in your life that was so incredibly significant is that it's almost like survival forced you to have that direct ear to the Lord 
and to really focus in that directly yet that survival mode led to thriving from survival to really thriving, which you're doing now. And that is very much in a way like from death to life, like there was a chiseling and a shaping and a formation that happened through all of that so that you could be free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were so, it, it was, it's just crazy what God can like, it's like, I didn't even know parts of me that needed resurrection until this happened. And like the band-aids that I had placed <clears throat> over things from my childhood and all kinds of other, you know, just little wounds. I and mean, we're all so wounded and our, we are wounding our children and our, you know, our children will wound their children. And it's just the hu- the human cycle. And I don't, I think it's hard, you know, in, in, if you're going through psychotherapy or if you're going through whatever kind of healing journey you're going through and everybody is, whether you are aware of it or not, you are on a healing journey. You are like waiting to be resurrected in some way. Um, and I think when we start to acknowledge that stuff, like, Ooh, my mom hurt me in that way. Or like my sister or somebody, you know, all these, these things that happened, I think we, it's tempting to go into like, and now I blame them and now that's their fault. And so I don't have to have a relationship with them anymore. It's like, no, no, (laughs) you know, God is redeeming all of it and God can use these times of just digging in this painful, like basically like massaging the scar tissue of your heart that he allows those relationships to flourish. If you, I mean, you can be honest, you can get reconciliation. You, I mean, there's just so much that's possible if you're willing to go through that sort of painful acknowledgement of wounds. Um, I love how you're talking about this. I love what you're saying. And Elizabeth, I think it takes a lot of courage, even courage in a moment to pick up the phone or just to be sincere with someone, to be sincere with ourselves. And I know even like a lot of people will avoid the silence, like the silence with the Mm -hmm. Lord. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, Elizabeth, like that has been one of the greatest places that I've ever met the Lord is in the silence. And, Mm -hmm. and even in the silence of my heart, when I'm in a noisy place, but Mm -hmm. really it's that that going to be with the Lord in silence, but a lot of people avoid that because it's intimidating and they haven't experienced the treasure of it yet. Because I think once the treasure is experienced, it's like Easter. It's so amazing. There's a deep longing and desire Mm -hmm. to return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were talking in the beginning about conversion too. I kind of want to go back to that because I feel like one of the things I have to remember is that it's daily. It's not a one-time thing or like once a year or whatever you have to every single day say, Jesus, I surrender to you. Take care of everything, everything, whatever is going to happen to me today. I forget which saint it is who says like, you need to view the interruptions in your life as like God's pathway to holiness for you that day. <laughs> so, as a homeschooling mom, I will tell you that is a very helpful concept. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just changing the way you approach your day. You know, like you make your plan, you have what you think is going to happen, and then you just turn it over to him and you say, "Okay, here's what I think. This is my best guess about how this is going to go. But whatever you want, whatever you send me today, is what your will is for me today, and I'm just going to." accept it with open hands. I mean, clearly we're going to be terrible at that on a lot of days, but it's, it's hopeful, right? Like you can change every day. It's a new beginning. And it's that it's Easter every day, every single day you get to wake up and say, Christ is risen in me. The old is passing away. I get to choose today to live into the resurrection. Um, and that has been, I mean, that has been a huge thing that it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. Today is brand new and I get to move forward into that. Yes. And there's another Saint quote, Saint Junipero Sarah, Saint Junipero Sarah, where it's always forward, never back. And I Mm -hmm. love that so much because I think it's so easy to fall back in woulda, shoulda, couldas, guilt, shame, Mm -hmm. things that are not of the Lord instead of moving forward in joy and hope. I think that's really actually a critical part of, of living Easter in, in our lives. And that's what I'm hearing from you, Mm -hmm. Elizabeth. And I, 
I, it strikes me what you're saying too about conversion because the way that I've been thinking about this lately, and it's probably timely because it's like really lately of recent, is that there's conversion, you know, that initial surrender of our hearts to the Lord. And then there's reversion, like the really big times, like when someone really does pull away from the Lord and there is a true return or like when we go to reconciliation and there is a return to the Lord in that healing sacrament because you're talking about our woundedness. Mm -hmm. And then there's the daily return to mm -hmm. the Lord, which maybe are tiny reversions. I mean, I don't know. It just depends yeah. that like you're talking about our dependency on that. And I relate to that, Elizabeth. And I wonder for everybody listening and Elizabeth, I think this is so beautiful because I think this could really change someone's life listening. And mm -hmm. it's a beautiful reminder to my heart. And I imagine yours too, Elizabeth, like in a moment, just like in a moment, in a day, we can choose to have our eyes, our gaze forward on Christ and to choose to live in the hope of Christ and to open ourselves to that grace. And there's a lot of scripture about putting our minds on what is above mm -hmm. and it's changing. It's life changing. Mm -hmm. It's heart changing. It's soul changing. And Elizabeth, this is really telling me why you have this beautiful charism is because this is what you do. albeit imperfectly like all of us. We're all, we're all in our own hot masses and we're yeah. all, you know, for the very most part, we're all trying to do the best we can. And then mm -hmm. sometimes we kind of, you know, let go and are like, oh my gosh, like have a moment of real lack of grace. Like we all do that. Yeah. Yet our loving Lord is always inviting us back, inviting us back. Back. Mm -hmm. It's so it's so miraculous too how like a, a tiny shift can change how much grace you allow into your life. Like if you are constantly sort of pushing the present away from you because it's uncomfortable, then you lack the grace to handle what's actually happening to you. Like that's this has happened to me so many times, especially early on where like my present reality was so painful and uncomfortable that I would just like sit, sit on my phone and like stare at Instagram and be like, what else is there? Cause I don't want to be where I am, you know? Um, and then I would, and then something would happen with my kids and I would sort of pop out and be shocked that they were doing whatever they were doing, which if I had been present to them, wouldn't have been surprising at all. You know, that kind of situation where you're like, I don't know, not there because you're on your phone. <laughs> And then you pop back in and you're like, what happened while I was gone? You know, um, I don't know. That's been, that's been a huge thing to me just to remember that when I'm present, that's when God is also there with me. If I, if I depart from faithfulness to whatever my vocation is that day, then he's, he, he can't be there cause I'm not there. You know, I have to invite him and I have to allow what's happening in my life to be what it is. Um, and yeah, that will change your prayer too. I feel like he gives me the prayer I need to pray so that he can give me the gift that I need that day. Uh, one day, a couple of months ago, I it, it just had like a moment where I was like, you know what? I need to pray today that I will just delight in my children because it can feel like a slog. It's January. The sun never shone in January in Michigan. Never. Like it was so dark. We were all sort of like suffering in our like little golem world. Like we're never going to see the sun again. And we're all out of each other's throats. And I was like, okay, every morning I'm going to get up and I'm just going to say, Lord, allow me to delight in my children. And it helped so much because then I would see them, you know, I would see their little cute things they were doing or how hard they were trying to learn to read or figuring out, you know, just all the little, their little isms. And, and see what they were becoming instead of how inconvenient they were or how annoying they were or whatever. And it, that was such a blessing. It's just a slight change in perspective and asking the Lord to help you see them differently. And that just was so beautiful and freeing. And again, do I do that every day? No, absolutely not. I'm trying and I should, but I'm not, I have not arrived. So yeah, I just, that, that was a good, that was a good revelation for me. I, mean, I feel like, like you are giving little mini maps to opportunities for great transformation by mm -hmm. God. And I love your authenticity that you're like, do I do this every day? No. And do I do it perfectly all the time? No, because nobody does. Right. Yet it goes back to that gaze mm -hmm. on, on God and that gaze on Christ. And oh my gosh, like it's almost like a beautiful calling out. I don't know if everybody else feels this way of like avoiding whatever it is, avoiding relationships, 
avoiding circumstances. Mm-hmm. Yet what you're saying, Elizabeth, what I'm hearing from you is that when we are present, like Christ is present to us mm-hmm. and we open our hearts to the Lord, the Lord will grace us with what we need rather than us choosing distraction and choosing not to be present because Jesus is presence itself, holy presence itself. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is so hard though. There are so many ways to numb pain, you know, there's just like, there's social media, there's food, there's alcohol, there's just all these different ways that we try to not feel the weight of the cross that's in our life. But you have to, I mean, you have to, if you want it to redeem you, you have to let it be there and feel it. And it's very uncomfortable, but it's possible, you know, he doesn't get, we can't handle. If you want to, I love that. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful question really for all of us. Do I want that? Do I want that kind of freedom? Am I willing to go through the discomfort to get to the freedom and the joy of the Lord. Because so beautiful, Elizabeth. Through suffering and death to get to resurrection, but that is the only path. You know? Yes. You can't yes. get there. You can't achieve that mountaintop without having gone all the way through the valley. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, he's so faithful. Just one little step at a time. Yes. And I feel like in our different seasons of our lives that we need new life regularly. Like we, even in really intense situations, because we're navigating, let's say marriage, if we're married, we're navigating raising children with all different kinds of needs Mm -hmm. and dynamics unfolding family life and then extended family life and communities ourselves. I had this beautiful Nashville Dominican nun in the Lenten series. And she talked all about us being kind of our own most difficult crosses, just ourselves. And you kind of touched, touched upon some of that, like the weeding out and the working like deep within yourself. And then also in your relationships, like that really deep healing work that, Mm -hmm. that comes from our woundedness Mm -hmm. and, and the way that we wound ourselves just by the way that we think and wrap our minds around things and pull away or distract ourselves. So this is a really beautiful invitation to authenticity and to really allowing God into all the nooks and crannies of our hearts and lives. And so sadly, you know, a lot of this came for you from a tragic loss yet. This is an Easter podcast and this is, is an Easter story because I'm sure that you miss your husband tremendously. Okay. I mean, and I will never stop. It's such a It's such a paradox because I could not have become the strong and increasingly holy person that I am. That's such a weird thing to say about yourself. But I mean, I do see the fruit of it. I think it's okay to own that you have allowed the Lord to heal you and that he's working more powerfully in your life. I think that's okay. Um, But that I couldn't have become that, I don't think, in any other way. And that was why the Lord allowed this to happen. So it's very, it's a super strange thing to say, like, I am grateful, even though I would never choose it. I would never have chosen that path for myself. I am still grateful that of the things that the Lord has provided because of it. Yes. And that goes back to the lack of control. Like there's an acceptance there that this did unfold. And so what are you going to allow the Lord to do with it in you? Right. You can keep fighting against it, but it won't go away. It will still be there. You can, I mean, and accepting it honestly is much less painful than trying to fight to get it. I'll do that. It can't, I mean, if you don't accept it, it doesn't stop being true. (laughs) It's still Mm -hmm. there. He's still gone, whether I like it or not. I mean, and yeah, yeah. there's so much wisdom in that statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And any final thoughts that you want to share with everyone? I think. Oh, I don't know. I, I want to say that if, if you are the one suffering, whatever the burden is, it is not too heavy for you because Jesus is actually holding it already. And if someone in your life is deeply, deeply suffering, just keep showing up without expectations and without judgment and just keep loving that person wherever they are, whatever they need in that moment. Keep praying that God will give you the wisdom to know what it is that they need and how you can support them because it may not be what you think. 
It may, you may have envisioned that you could support them in some way and it's just not happening that way. And that can feel frustrating as like a, as a supporter of a grieving person, I think. Um, but just in, in all cases, just to choose humility and to try to try to love so deeply and allow that love of Christ to flow through you and to, to receive it in the same way. I mean, I think when we give, we really do receive so much. Yes. Amen. So merciful, such a merciful and loving reflection of Christ. Mm -hmm. And in that spirit, can you close us in prayer, Elizabeth? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, we praise you for our crosses. And we praise you above all for having accepted so tenderly your own cross because of love for us. Please help us to shoulder our crosses with grace, to kiss them like we're kissing your face and bring us through all of our struggles to resurrection in our lives, but ultimately to the great joyful resurrection of heaven where we will share in your presence forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together. I ask you to bless every single person who's listening to this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. And how can everyone get a hold of you? I'm on Instagram um, at Eliza Wright. <laughs> You'll have to spell it. You'll see it in the... <laughs> um, and that's pretty much it right now. I'm working on some other stuff. Hopefully there'll be a book at some point, but that's... That's mostly in my head at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing your beautiful heart with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was just a pleasure. And it is a pleasure and delight to be with everyone gathered and know that we are praying for you and hoping for a resurrection in your own heart, in your own life. And if there's any way I can be supportive, reach out at mamasinspirit at gmail.com. And you can also go to mamasinspirit.com or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe and find podcasts about all the things. Over 250 glorious humans have shared their heart and their stories. And so I imagine that there are a number waiting for you to help you hopefully exactly where you're at. Can't wait to be together again next time. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.